The first word from the cross. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. You've had a tough week. Maybe school assignments were pretty rough. Maybe you had all you could do to try to take care of the kids. Maybe something at work didn't go quite right. You're kind of like a ticking time bomb walking around. How do your words sound when you're tired and you're all stressed out? Are they bitter? Are they harsh? Are they cutting? Or what about when someone sins against you or against me? Do you get angry? Do you feel hurt? Do you want to withhold forgiveness from them? Or, or maybe on the outside you make it nice and like you've forgiven, but on the inside you haven't. That's not forgiveness. That's a fantasy. To think that God would tolerate th that I could go through the outward motions of forgiving someone and not do it in my heart. And then... Your conscience bothers you because you know that's not right. You know that's wrong. And you get angry at God because he wants you to forgive. And you've just picked up the hammer and you've just joined the soldiers in pounding a nail into Jesus. You can think of the worst week, month, or year you've ever had in your life. It can't compare to the week that Jesus went through. All of his friends deserted him. He's arrested for something he didn't do. He's whipped, he's beaten, and now he's being hung on a cross. Could you blame Jesus for berating the soldiers, berating his disciples, berating you and me? But those aren't the words we hear from the cross, are they? They're words of forgive them, of forgiveness. Not just the outward action, but the full intention of his heart. You see, Jesus got it. When they were committing those sins, pounding those nails into Jesus, when we commit any sin, we're committing spiritual suicide. God doesn't want that. Jesus didn't want that. He wants us forgiven. Aren't isn't this word of Jesus a great comfort? We know that he wants to forgive us. He wasn't forced to go to the cross. He chose to do it. And this first word of Jesus, the motivation too, isn't it? When we're reluctant to forgive others. We read Luke 23, 26 to 34. As the soldiers led him away, they seized Simons from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and your children, for a time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. Our second word from the cross Today you will be with me in paradise. Words are a window to our hearts, aren't they? They show us what we're thinking and feeling inside. Think about the two thieves on the cross that were crucified with Jesus. One thief, 
He lashed out in anger at God. He was suffering horribly on the cross, and he was angry at Jesus for not doing anything about it. I think we can relate to how he's feeling, can't we? Haven't there been times that we've lashed out in anger because of suffering that we've gone through in our life? Now consider the other thief on the cross. His words were a window to his heart. He was suffering the same way. But instead of lashing out at Jesus, he simply said, this is what I deserve. I don't deserve anything better. His was a humble plea to Jesus to remember him when he comes into his kingdom. So how do you know that when you're suffering, when you've lost a loved one, when your health is failing, when you've had to go through a change in your life, when you've encountered disappointments, how do you know that when you're suffering, it's not that God is punishing you? It's not that he's withdrawn his love from you. Look at Jesus' words. You know it's not a punishment because Jesus says his kingdom is not of this world. Suffering is of this sinful world. That's not part of God's plan and God's kingdom. God's kingdom is paradise. Think the garden. Of Think perfect physical beauty. Think of the joy of being with Jesus in total happiness. No sorrow, no sadness, no sickness, no death, no tears. That's Jesus' kingdom. What will it be like to be in paradise? Oh, you and I will know soon enough. Because that very moment we die, we won't have to wait. He said to the thief, didn't he? Today, this very moment, you'll be with me in paradise. What did that thief have to fear? Nothing. What do we have to fear? Nothing. We read God's word, Luke 23, 35 to 43. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others. Let him save himself if he's God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who was hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. The third word from the cross Dear woman, here is your son. Here is your mother. For 33 years, Mary had been the mother of Jesus, caring for Jesus just like any of you mothers would care for your child. From little on, when he was completely helpless, taking care of every need, seeing him grow up into adolescence and then become his own adult person on his own. And so she's there at the cross where Jesus is crucified. And don't you think that what was going through her minds were the words that Simeon, ancient, aged Simeon spoke? Remember when he held baby Jesus in the temple and he said to Mary, and a sword will pierce your soul too? Well, this was it. The blade struck. But if you think about it, as he's seeing his mother there at the foot of the cross crying, don't you think it's just a little bit trivial that he would pay attention to her suffering? 
You and I can't even imagine the pain of being crucified on the cross, struggling to breathe. And that doesn't even pale to the pain that Jesus was suffering, carrying the world's sin. Yet he had time to pay attention to his mother's suffering. Isn't that a comfort for you? Because sometimes maybe we are tempted to think, well, Jesus just cares about the spiritual big things, you know, like forgiving my sins and getting me to heaven. He does. But he also cares about the trivial details in your life, even down to your physical care. Let's not forget that as we see and hear these words of our Savior. We'll read John 19, 23 to 27. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them, with the undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened that the scripture might be fulfilled that said, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to her, Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. From that time on, this disciple took her into his home. The fourth word from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? From noon until 3 p.m., the sky went black. Can you imagine that? Pitch black. Not a star, not a moon, nothing. At the end of those three hours of pitch blackness is when Jesus cried out these words from the cross. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you ever stop to imagine what it's like to be forsaken from God, to be separated from God. It's the wages of our sin. It's hell. It's being without hope, without light, curse upon curse. It's hell. It's worms eating your body but never finishing you up. It's flames burning you but never killing you. It's hell. And Jesus went there. Jesus spoke these words to let you know that he was delivered over to hell in your place and in my place. So we could be absolutely certain that punishment has been paid. And through Jesus, you and I will never, ever go there. Never, ever ever to be forsaken by God. We read Mark 15, 33 to 36. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard it, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff, and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. The fifth word from the cross, I am thirsty. It's easy to pass over those three words, right? I'm thirsty. It's easy to see those as simple, normal words you expect someone hanging on a cross to speak along with a lot of other words. Of course he was thirsty. He hadn't anything to drink. He was hanging in the sun. He was suffering. 
But don't miss the significance of those words. Because we've seen this in the life of Jesus before, haven't we? Do you remember back when Jesus was in his hometown of Nazareth? And remember that one day he walked into the synagogue, that was the church the Jews worshipped in? And he stood up and he opened the scroll to Isaiah and he read. And do you remember what he said after he finished reading from the prophet Isaiah? Today, Scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Or do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane when impetuous Peter grabs his sword and he wants to fight for Jesus? <clears throat> remember what Jesus told him? Peter, put your sword away. Don't you think I can't call on 12 legions of angels to rescue me? But do you remember what he said after that? But then how would Scripture be fulfilled that said I'd have to die in this way? Or what we read earlier about the clothes of Jesus be, dividing by, be divided by lots? Exactly what Psalm 22 prophesied would happen? I am thirsty. Psalm 22 prophesied that Jesus would be thirsty on the cross. He spoke those words to show us how he fulfilled all Scripture. God has a plan. Prophecy shows us that plan. From Genesis 3, 15, the promise of the Savior, all throughout, we see every prophecy kept. God has a plan. And he kept that plan when it came to our salvation. If that's true, then can't you and I believe and trust every other promise that God makes in Scripture? We read John 19, 28 on the bottom of 9. Later, knowing that everything had now been finished and so that scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. The sixth word from the cross, it is finished. You go into Walmart, you buy whatever you're buying, and you leave with a white piece of paper in your hand, right? It's a receipt. It shows that you paid for what you have, and you can walk out with it, not be arrested for shoplifting. If Jerusalem of Jesus' time had a Walmart, and his disciples would have bought something there, the piece of paper or the scroll they would have walked out with would have said on it, it is finished. It is finished was a statement from accounting. A statement that said the amount that you owed was paid in full. As Christians who believe in Jesus, you walk around with a receipt. You walk around with these words of Jesus that say, it is finished. All your sins have been paid in full. Don't ever forget that. Until your dying breath and you enter that paradise, we walk around with a receipt from God. It is finished, paid in full. Don't ever doubt that any of your sins could not be forgiven. We read John 19. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on a stalk of the hyssop plant, and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, It is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Our seventh and last word from the cross. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. 
It's a frightening moment, isn't it? I know it's a frightening moment for every one of you here because none of you have yet experienced it. It's an uncertain moment. It's the moment of death. But the moment of Jesus' death was not at all uncertain for him. He knew exactly where he was going, into his Father's hands. Jesus spoke these last words from the cross for you and for me to comfort us, to assure us that death, that moment, is far from uncertain for you and me. It's absolutely certain. You see, death has nothing to fear for you who believe in Jesus. The devil be damned for you and me who believe in Jesus. He can't speak a thing to us on our deathbed for whom there is no condemnation because we believe in Christ Jesus. And no, you will not be alone when you breathe your last. You, like Jesus, will be in your Father's hands. We read Luke 23. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining, and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat to their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. The burial. Later, Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body of Jesus. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he came and took the body away. He was accompanied by Nicodemus, the man who earlier had visited Jesus at night. Nicodemus brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds. Taking Jesus' body, the two of them wrapped it with the spices and strips of linen. This was in accordance with Jewish burial customs. At the place where Jesus was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. Because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and since the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. 